Hello and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host Jeffrey Augustine. Today we have with us Bill Franks. Bill, welcome to the show. Thank you. Hey Bill, you were appointed uh, by L. Ron Hubbard as Chairman of the Board, Executive Director International for Life of the Church of Scientology International. You were a very powerful man in the church. What year did uh, Mr. Hubbard appoint you to those uh, positions? The first one was 1979, which was the Senior Management Executive and that evolved into getting a lifetime appointment from him in 1980 as uh, Executive Director International and Chairman of the Board of Churches. How does power work in the L. Ron Hubbard era of Scientology? How did you come to power? I came to power because I had worked with Hubbard for about three and a half years total on a pretty close uh, arrangement on board of his ship. When's the first time you met L. Ron Hubbard and what were your impressions? Like, how do you get to meet L. Ron Hubbard? Well, my first uh, meeting with L. Ron Hubbard was in 1970, in November of 1970. I had gone to the ship to do the FEBC, OEC and the FEBC, uh, and get my L's. Uh, I just had arrived on the ship and I ended up somehow in his office. We just started shooting the shit, so to speak, about uh, for about 40 minutes. I guess you each had a favorable impression of one another? Well, yeah, I was uh, totally uh, a true believer at that point. What were you doing in life? What were you doing for a living? Well, I had, uh, I had graduated from college in uh, June of 1968. I enlisted in the Marine Corps. I ended up breaking my back down in Paris Island. <clears throat> South Carolina at boot camp, ended up in Scientology. Did you guys talk about the military or college or was it just straight Scientology? It was just straight Scientology. It was Tony that I had come from the LA organization and we got to talking about some of the people there that he might have known like Julia Salmon, some of the old timers. Did you get a feeling that Aaron Hubbard was very well connected into his church and knew what was going on everywhere? At that point, yeah. Would you say he was a hands-on manager of his church? Yeah, at that point, yes. Yes, he was. Yeah. For new Scientology watchers, the courses you came to do, the FEBC, OEC, and the ELS, these are the big high-level merit badges you can earn in Scientology, and they're difficult to get. They're expensive. So Hubbard knows you're very committed to Scientology, and by extension, you're very committed to him. Yes. In that meeting, I asked him if I could join the Sea Org, and that was when I became a Sea Org member. So he accepted on the spot? Mm -hmm. Yes, he did. How does that change your trajectory or career path within Scientology when you move from being a public member to a Sea Org member? In his eyes, it, it indicated my commitment. As a logistics matter, how long had you been scheduled to stay on the ship, and how long did you actually stay? Well, I was there for about three months doing the OEC, FEBC, and uh, I did the OEC and the FEBC underneath Hubbard. He was running the course with the help of two people, and uh, he gave us all the lectures. And I left in, in I guess, mid-February, 71. And you leave as a Sea Org member? Oh, yeah. What is the first position you have in the uh, Sea Organization? I was the commanding officer of the LA Org then. Really? You went right into the CO role for the ship? Yes. Now that's fascinating to me as an outsider because you know nor it's not normally done that way, but you're a college graduate and you've done some of the top work and Hubbard likes you. So you go back, when you take over uh, a job from someone else, there was a previous CO before you, had they been sacked or fired or what did you walk into? Was it a mess? Was it in good shape? It was not in good shape. Everything went on to a new organizational board, organizational chart. I didn't get rid of anybody. I just moved everybody around and, and took over as a commanding officer. In terms of staying in communication with Hubbard, you just, uh, because he's a command channels guy, you just sort of send your reports up line every week. When Ron wants to know something, does he query you? I had a lot of personal communication when I went back there, but I, I don't think that Hubbard necessarily liked me. I think he felt he could control me. Maybe that's why he liked me. Well, now that's a really crucial insight, Bill. He didn't like you, but he could, could control you. That he found more useful. 
Did you feel that you were being controlled or were you, did you feel like you were serving? Oh, no, I definitely felt I was serving at that point. I didn't really start wising up for about another year, year and a half. I got a whole perspective on things. So over like, say, uh, 18 months of in the Sea Org, your idealism gets degraded. Well, it did for me. Well, I mean, it's happened to a lot of people. What was the general scene at the Los Angeles Org in 71? Was, it, uh, was there any controversies or fires, problems you had to handle? Not really. I was there for about three months and then I was recalled back to flag. Oh, I see. So you were CO for three months and then your order back to the flagship Apollo. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was. Why do they summon you back to the flagship? Everything started uh, statistically going up. And along with that, there was a lot of uh, controversy, I guess. And, and because of that, we were uh, called back to the ship, mostly by the guardian's office at the time. Who's the we that were called back, commanding officers? Well, there was, yeah, well, there was uh, the whole, it was Alex Zaborski, who was the uh, continental captain, I guess his name was and probably about five or six other people. So a lot of the big bosses are called back to the Apollo by the Guardian's office. Yeah. How do you how do you interpret this as a Scientology executive? Are you in trouble? Well, yeah, we were, uh, <laughs> yes, yes, we were in trouble. Well, in the GEO Guardian's office is led by Mary Sue Hubbard, mm -hmm. the Commodore's wife. What does the Guardian's office want to know? Do, does it begin with sex checking? Yeah, I, a guy named Brian Livingston, who was a class 12, uh, ended up giving me worth of two months worth of sex check. I mean, every day? Just about every day. I mean, psychologically, how do you stand the strain? Well, it just got worse. <laughs> For the next 10 years, it got worse. I, I remember I, I uh, fly on the ship, you know, you were given the privilege of sending a daily report to Hubbard. And uh, I remember I, I sent him a thing saying, like, I don't know why I'm here. Things were, were doing well in Los Angeles. Why is this? And he sent me back. I remember this very distinctly. In fact, I used to, I kept it. He sent me an eight page written on full scrap paper, uh, you know, legal size paper explanation of you. And it, it started out with, you're going to be on the ship until I find out who is making me and flag into a bad person. So I proceeded to get sex check. I didn't know the answer to that. I think the reason that we were there was Mary Sue had a real problem with things that we were doing with Scientology. Such as? Oh, I don't know. It, it was... Uh, this goes back a few years, but it was, uh, we were trying to expand Scientology. As true believers, we really believed that there wasn't anything we couldn't do. And the Guardian's office had a different view on things. And so there was an, a conflict. It was more of a, a power struggle, I think, between the Guardian's office and the Sea Org. Now that's a, a crucial conflict in the Hubbard era the conflict between the Guardian's office and the Sea Org. Why did L. Ron Hubbard create the Guardian's office? And how was it different than the Sea Org, at least on paper? Well, the Guardian's office didn't have to sign any crazy make-believe contract for a billion years, number one. Number two, he built the Sea Org idea all around a fake Navy, which is what Karen calls it, and it's, that's what it was. Whereas, and it has a military aspect to it, whereas the Guardian's office didn't. And the Guardian's office, from my perspective's main job, in Hubbard's eyes, was to keep him out of jail. I mean, that's the whole reason why he got into uh, this living on ships offshore. Uh, he referred to it as a Fabian organization, which which couldn't be pinned down and uh, was basically beholden to nobody. You know, when you're in international waters, that's really the fact. Anyway, there was this continual tension between the Guardian's office and the Sea Org. In a study of power, it's not uncommon to have certain types of leaders 
set up those who work for them to oppose each other because it favors the leader. So Mary Sue Hubbard's running the Guardian's office, Hubbard's running the Sea Org as Commodore, and they're vying for his favor, his affections, resources. Do you think Hubbard deliberately set it up for them to be in conflict? Oh, absolutely. It definitely benefited him from, in his opinion, that it benefited him. Does it make each group try to be more hardcore or radical and to gain favor with him? No doubt. Mary Sue is in an interesting position on the ship because she's married to Ron, but she's in charge of the Guardian's office. She's also a Sea Org member, correct? Yes. Was Jane Kember a Sea Org member? No, she was not. Mary Sue's deputy, Jane Kember, is not in the Sea Org. In, in, in other words, what I'm asking is, as a Sea Org member, who are you equal to in the Guardian's office? They're really not equivalent insofar as... Uh... The Guardian's office had their own little fiefdom, and the Sea Org on the ship had their fiefdom. And your the power that you had was purely based on how close you were to hover. So your proximity to source. <laughs> I, yeah, I wouldn't want to put it that way, but yes, that was that's the way it was. Well, it's not unusual in organizations, you know, you're, you're, how connected you are to the boss. That's in any kind of organization. How much did you have direct access to L. Ron Hubbard? And in other words, you, you had a good comm line with him as Scientology would say. Could you pretty much see Hubbard when you needed to? Well, it depended. I mean, on what, when I ended up with my sec checking going back to 71, I uh, became his org officer from that uh, point of view, I, I I work with him on a daily basis. What is the role of the org officer? What does he or she do? Well, the idea was, wasn't it, was to keep, the, in, in brief, was to keep the organization up in terms of personnel, equipment, keep up with production. In other words, sort of to enable production to happen. So that's product, the org aboard the ship. Yeah, well, it was your, it was a ship, but it was also everything going on internationally as well. Now, would would you have been uh, the org officer for the, for the flag organization worldwide? Well, at that time, there wasn't much of a flag organization worldwide, but yes, I was. The power kind of went with Hubbard. You know, he didn't delegate it to anybody that I know of. And that's why he called it his flagship. That's where the pa the power is. The Commodore's flag is on board. Ha now, when you're on a when you're on a tightly confined ship sailing around the Mediterranean, and you have the Guardian's office and the Sea Org in conflict, it's got to be tense daily life aboard the ship at the whim of L. Ron Hubbard. Well, wh uh, Bill, what happened with your sack checks? How did how did those end? I guess they ended up in a draw. In my period. Uh, uh, time on the Sea Org, I probably got 1,500, 2,000 hours worth of sec checking. To your knowledge, did L. Ron Hubbard ever answer the question, what is making him and the ship a bad person? The actual dispatch said, who's, who's making me and Flag into suppressive people? He never answered that question. No, that was the question he said, I'm going to, I never coughed up an answer. I never really quite understood the whole power scheme at that point. Uh, it ended with me and six other people. Hubbard needed money. Hubbard wanted money. The flagship was broke. We, we, the last ten thousand dollars they had for food, they gave to whoever the the head cook was at that time. He went out uh, to buy food. I think we we're. Uh, like we were in Morocco then, somewhere, and uh, he absconded with the ten thousand dollars. <laughs> that is so. That is such a so typically Scientology. He <laughs> he blows with. So the ship is broke. So me and six other guys were sent to wherever we could get money. That's where we ended up. We ended up. Uh, choosing to go to Boston because that was considered to be an affluent uh, city. It was, it was uh, referred to as the command team and we were all sent 
to make money. And the fact that we were sending money back, I think, absolved us of any crimes we might have had. Because money buys forgiveness in Scientology. Well, it did with Hubbard. <laughs> well, money buys forgiveness almost anywhere in corporate life. There's a saying, the money sets you free. But I digress. You know, it's interesting that Hubbard's, Hubbard's sex checking question, find out who is making me and flag a bad person. Can that question even be answered? Well, I don't know. That was what he put in the, his uh, return uh, dispatch to me. So I think that was the general theme of that two months of sex checking. Well, it's interesting because to, to, in my opinion, and correct me if I'm wrong, Bill, but to answer that question, you would, it would be an indictment of Elrond Hubbard on the system he created. Yeah. That's... It, you know, it's amazing, uh, Jeff, that 10 years later, after I had been uh, removed by him from the chairman of the board and ED International, I was back at almost an identical situation getting sex check, whereas he was the CS and I, I would have sessions. She would run them for a couple of days and send out the folders to him in LA. It was the same kind of thing. He was looking around to find out at that, in that particular instance, he was sure that I had been, I had been PDH by the F, uh, FBI. Now explain to our listeners just what PDH means. Uh, pain, drug, and hypnosis. So the feds had gotten to you. This is just for... Hubbard's, in Hubbard's mind. Oh, exactly, it, it, precisely. But, but see, this was something you said earlier, Bill, uh, the CERG was created and the GEO was created to keep Hubbard out of jail. So long before uh, program Snow White raids, he was already paranoid and afraid of going to jail. Yeah, and that paranoia just kept on getting worse and worse and worse in over over those years. But uh, yeah, that that's really what was driving the whole thing, including forming the Sea Org and, and staying away from governments. Now, Bill, as, as a student of Alron Hubbard, and you knew the man personally, do you think he was inherently paranoid or does he become increasingly paranoid over time from 1950 forward? Well, I don't know what happened back in 1954, but 71, he was uh, looking back on it now, he was definitely very paranoid. By so you can, only, you can only work with the man you meet in 1971. Yeah. And by then the church has been going on for 21 years, Dianetics and Scientology, he's well established. Now you go to Boston, uh, and you guys bring some solvency back to the ship. What happens when the ship is solvent again? Do you go back to the flagship? No. Uh, uh, then he brought me to LA Org, back to LA Org. LA Org wasn't doing very well, and I uh, was there for a couple of years, I think. Did you resume your post as commanding officer? Yes. Now, what does the LA Org deliver? What is its main mission to do? At that time, it was just. Uh, um, it was a class four org. So basically, you're just doing a lot of the bread and butter Scientology services. That's correct, yeah. And about how many people would be on course just to do, to do a compare then and now? Oh, I don't I don't have any idea what it's doing now, but uh, yeah. we had about, I'd say about two, three hundred people on, on course. How, how big was the staff? Mm, the, over, about 110. Yeah. Was the Celebrity Center, had it been started yet? Oh, yeah. Yvonne, yeah. I think they started in 68. Was that a prestige thing? Did you feel that Scientology was growing and accomplishing its mission? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I was uh, inebriated with the juice of clearing the planet. <laughs> That's Hubbard's main focus is to clear the planet. So you believe planetary clearing was possible if enough clears and OTs were made. Mm -hmm. Now, at this time, had you made OT yet? Were you? I, at this point, I think I had, uh, I was clear OT from L, taking, from having L10 through 12 delivered. I, I declared clear OT at one point. I don't know what that, oh. what that is, but. Yeah, I'm not sure either clear OT. Well, there were some, uh, the, 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 
bridge has changed over time, but didn't you wind up being an OT5? Yeah, that's right. Bill, when you just changing subjects for a minute, when you did OT3, where did you do it at? And what did you think when you read the OT3 course pack about Xenu? <laughs> you want to know what I thought or what I did? Both. <laughs> I want to know everything. <laughs> I think I had a, uh, I think my, when I finally looked at the materials, I had, uh, I guess I read it on to OT3 19, early 1970. It was before I came to the ship. And then when I, after I'd been uh, busted and I had been on the deck for a month or so, uh, this is before I came over officer, I was in charge of uh, all the advanced course material. And I remember I read all the stuff he had written about OT3. Just, I mean, folders and folders and folders of LRH's personal stuff. I just, I, I was able to sort of like distance myself enough to, to realize how ridiculous a lot of this stuff seemed. But, you know, when you, when you join a cult, you don't really, you're not there because you like to think. Hmm. You like to have somebody else think for you. You know, that's why I, I having a strict dogma is, 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 uh, an attractive thing and uh, I mean in that state of mind that gets you into the cult and I uh, I I just I would have these thoughts about this is like hilarious and, and I'm sure most people probably felt the same way or at least a lot of people felt the same way but I certainly wasn't going to reveal this to anyone when you're in L. Ron Hubbard's office on the flagship Apollo, and you've read the Xenu materials, you're actually sitting there with the author of the Xenu materials. Do those two things come together for you when you're sitting with L. Ron Hubbard? I get to know Hubbard later when I was his org officer. We would, he would call us up to his, his office at about one o'clock. You know, this was, at, this was hard because we had to get up at seven in the morning. We would be there, he would just go on and on an hour for three or four hours. Now, when you say we, who did he call you and who else? Uh, a guy named John Horowitz, who had just married uh, Diana, his daughter. Uh, the Commodore would summon you and John Horowitz, and he would just want to talk. Yeah, he would just start talking, and it just didn't stop. And I had a real problem because the more he talked, the looser he would get. Really? And uh, he would just, that's when I started, you know, hearing things like, God, I can't believe how much power and money I want. I just can't get enough of it. Was that a central preoccupation of Hubbard that he just wanted more money and more power? Well, that was my observation. But once once again, you know, you sort of filed this away under don't think about it too much. Well, I, I cut him a lot of slack because I just didn't think about it. Well, you would have to, Bill, because you're you're in with Aaron Hubbard and he's source. And yet, what's so interesting is to read the accounts of people who on a day-to-day -day business have to live with the real person, right? Day-to-day mm -hmm. -day reality of Hubbard versus the OT materials. Now, you as an OT, did L. Ron Hubbard impress you as being an OT? No, he, he, not at all. But once again, I just say, well, you know, this must be... I would. You know, you, you have these mental excuses that you learn to accept within yourself. So you compartmentalize. Mm -hmm. and the, the fact that Hubbard would, would call you up to his cabin along with John to, to chat for hours, was it a, a one-way flow where he did all the talking and you did all the listening? Generally, yes, that was the way it was. W would you say, Bill, from your experience with Ron Hubbard, that he did not like to be alone? It did occur to me that that's why we were there, because it would it would just get it would get to be like what the hell am I doing here? It's four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I got to get up in a few hours, you know. Of course, I wouldn't say that to him. And yet, the boss wants you there to so he could talk. Yeah. Did you ever feel like you were acting as a therapist or to him? No. So the point was just L. Ron Hubbard wanted company. 
that's what we were there for. Would it ever come up in sec checks uh, that you were, you know, you never gave any of this up in a sec check about your thoughts when you were you were spending time with Hubbard? Hell no, absolutely not. And the reason I ask is most people would think, most people in the church would think it'd be a great honor to spend hours, endless hours with L. Ron Hubbard, but you're finding it to be tedious? Yeah, after all those lectures, and they were pretty intimate, there were only about like 10 people in the room and then Hubbard going on about the FEBC. And I think there were 14 different lectures, as I recall. From that perspective, I, it was pretty easy to still place him there as a superior being. But once you got to see him, you know, like familiarity, I guess, breeds contempt. And uh, he was certainly open for a lot of contempt. He had some really ugly characteristics about him. What were some of his ugly characteristics? Bad sense of humor, overbearing, uh, sloppy, sloppy in his behavior. That would be enough. Oh, certainly. How did he impress you as a thinker? He didn't impress me as a thinker. I, I could as, go back to the FEBC lectures. That, I mean, I could put him on a pedestal uh, during that period of time. But a few months later, when he, he was having me up to his office all the time, it was just, it got to be just too damn much. You know, the first time, maybe it was a, a privilege. But after that, he was also a bully. Not only uh, people around him, but I found him a bully. Uh, like one time he said to me, when I first walked in, he said, you know, how does it feel to be in doubt? I said, what? He said, how does it feel to be in doubt? And then we ended up talking for about 20 minutes on what I, what I had to do to get out of doubt. He was just fucking with me. So he was psychologically intimidating, yeah. or he could be? Yeah, he definitely could be. Bill, many people talk about Oren Hubbard chain-smoking cool cigarettes. Did you observe him to chain-smoke? Oh, yeah. So he was the kind of guy who would have one in the ashtray and light another one up? That, and he always had a, uh, a Coke in his hand. Really, a Coke? Coca-Cola, yeah. Now, look at the nicotine and sugar going in the man's body. This is a controversial question, but I'm going to ask it. Do you think he was a drug user? No doubt. Uh, you know, I, I was friends with Kimma for a while, Kimma Dunleavy, who was his nurse. And uh, in, in 1985, she, she told me, she says, you know, Hubbard was totally impotent. And uh, I said, no, I didn't know that. And I won't get into how she knew that, but she, uh, she said, oh, yeah. Uh, we ended up having some long conversations, her and Hubbard did, about it. And it was due to all the steroids and drugs that he had taken back in the 50s. As far as drugs while he was on the ship, I have no idea. Bill, when did you leave the ship the second time? We left uh, to go to Boston to raise money for him in, uh, in the, uh, December of 71. Then I went to the LA org. I was there for, I think, about two years. That's when I married my first wife. Then she was RPS. She brought was brought back to the ship for training. And after a couple of months, I said, look, you know, either you send her back or you, I'm coming to, I said, well, come ahead then. And so I went and did the RPF. What did the RPF on the ship consist of? Was it just heavy manual labor? Yeah, we all slept in the hole of the ship uh, between the forecastle and uh, the main stupor structure of the ship. Yeah, we were up at five in the morning and we'd go to bed at like 10, 11 o'clock at night. So how long did it take you to complete the RPF? I got off in a couple of months. What happened when you left the RPF? Did you and your wife graduate it together? Yes, we did. And uh, we went on a six week leave, which was the first leave we ever had. Did you start thinking uh, or having doubts during your six week leave? Yes, but uh, we went back to the ship. I got put on the RPF again for I don't know what reason. So I, I just went right back to the ship. Then you went into auditing on the ship. And then I ran into Hubbard one morning before he went to bed. And uh, I just like literally bumped right into him. And we got to chatting. He said, what the hell are you doing on the RPF? I said, well, I thought you put me here. He said, no, no. 
said, you uh, get off of the RPS. So that was the end of that. It was a great thing to have happen. Yeah, yeah it was a nice morning. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Any morning you get off the RPF. I ended up going to SCDC, Family Church of Science, you know, DC Org. Stayed there for a couple of years. We were there for, I was the CO when it, uh, DC Org was rated in conjunction, you know, the FBI rate in conjunction with uh, the complex in LA. Being well, let me stop you there, Bill. So this would have been July 8, 1977. Yeah. Are you there when the FBI comes in with search warrants? Oh, yeah. You know, what the hell do you do when they come in with search warrants? I mean, you just have to comply. Yeah. What, what else can you do? Yeah. I mean, do, did you get on the phone right away to call headquarters? Fuck no. <laughs> no? <laughs> I just, I figured, look, you know, this is somebody else's problem. Not mine. <laughs> and besides, I wasn't getting on too well with the GO in DC at that point. And uh, that's where they went. They didn't spend any time really in, in the org. They went upstairs into like an annex, which is where the GO was. Oh, that helps me understand why it's not your problem. You are Sea Org and the raid is Guardian's office, therefore not your problem, which is actually a pretty smart way to think of it from an organizational approach. <laughs> Yeah, it was like those guys, like Mike Meisner, who was one of the guys who was caught in the Justice Building that night. I remember him looking pretty damn worried. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you mean the day of the raid? Yeah. I, yeah, and I guess with good reason, apparently. Now, what wh what's the, you already know Hubbard is paranoid and wants to stay out of jail. For you as a an executive in the church, what's the immediate fallout of the program Snow White raid by the FBI? Well, Hubbard started getting really worried. You know, uh, this was, this would be, the raid was what, 77 July, right? Yes, sir. And he was in DC in 76. I didn't see him, but two of his uh, messengers, Claire Rousseau, David Rousseau, uh, they lived with my wife and I, and we had this little house in Alexandria, Virginia, and they they lived with us, and uh, it was supposed to be very hush-hush that he was in town, but they confided to us one night that he was there, and uh, he was basically, they basically, what they said was he was on the run. He's on the run a year before the FBI raid. And yeah. do you know, Bill, do we know L. Ron Hubbard's whereabouts on the day of the actual Snow White raids? No, I, I didn't know. So the raid goes down. How do things change? Or is the security procedures go up? Do you, are there sec checks? Are there bloodletting? I mean, what is the aftermath of the raids? That's a big deal in church history. The Guardian's office has got harder and harder to deal with. Uh, they were very freaked out and I, part of the reason as I came to understand a couple of years later was Hubbard just really at that point he sealed himself off completely from Mary Sue and uh, which is a little bit later in my story uh, when I helped uh, put her in jail he just he start he got really aloof then so he becomes isolated. Uh, Bill, when's the last time that you personally, physically met with L. Ron Hubbard? 76, maybe? Early 76. In Washington, D.C.? No, I never, I didn't see him in D.C. I don't really remember what the circumstances were, but I didn't, from that point on, I never saw him again. Did you ever correspond with him? Oh, yeah. I did when I got appointed by him as uh, chairman of the board. And then after I got busted, I had a lot of dialogue with him. I came back from WDC and I assumed my position. And sometime in the beginning of July, Miscavige called me up from Gilman Hot Springs and said, hey, you know, uh, I've got to go ahead to get rid of the uh, GO. And he knew about my antipathy towards the GO. And he said, how would you like to head up that mission? I said, sure. And I was there on the next plane. So you were assigned to help take out the GO. Right. So uh, they was still on, David uh, Miskevich was still on his action aid. That was his position. And 
he was writing up the mission orders and he I was sitting there with him and John Nelson and he said hey listen John Nelson was his uh, Miscavige's assistant I don't remember his actual title but in in action uh, and Miscavige said to me he said look you got uh, I have a Hubbard wants me to get rid of Mary Sue he wants her gone I said what do you mean gone <laughs> He said he wants her to just drop all this legal horseshit and just submit to jail, go into jail. I just he wants her in jail because he does he feels that this is just a liability to him. And at this point, I what I gather was that Hubbard was looking at one thing at that point in his life, and that was he was just concerned about his welfare. And uh, so we, we saw that we needed to get rid of Mary Sue as the starting point to this mission. And Miscavige said, well, I, I want to do this before we actually go into the GO. So Mary Sue, if you take out the head of the GO, then the rest of the GO topples like dominoes. Right. So the actual sequence was, I think, two days, two days from that, Myself and David and John Nelson, I believe, was in a van outside of the Bonaventure Hotel, you know, the downtown. Yeah. Room. Yes. Uh, it was fairly new then. It's It's been a long time favorite Scientology meeting place. All right. Well, this it still is. This was, uh, I don't know. It, it, we were there and Mary Sue came and Dave and I interviewed Mary Sue. Mary Sue didn't like me at all. I had had several run-ins with her personally while I was on the ship. And uh, she, as I said, I didn't get along with a lot of Guardian's office personnel. So she wasn't real happy to see me, but she definitely was not happy. She had a real thing about messengers. Uh, mainly because you can you can sort of see it, you know, Hubbard rather than going and talking, hey, listen, dear, you know, lay off the whatever, uh, he would just send a messenger to her. So after a while, she just started, you ask any of the old messengers and they all will tell you that they, Mary Sue and, and them, it was like oil and water. So she shows up. And we, we basically tell her that Hubbard wants you out. And we threaten her uh, with saying, listen, Mary Sue, if you don't cooperate, you're going to be fucked anyways. And you'll, we'll, you'll be written out of the will. And so are all your kids. That's brutal. Yeah, it was pretty brutal. And uh, now, of course, I, I'm seeing this as this is just sort of validation for let's go in and clean house with the GO and get rid of all these damn lawsuits and let's get get honest, you know. No, I understand because the the new the new order under David Miscavige. No, well, Miscavige, Miscavige, Miscavige was still just an action aid. He, okay, so he, he's action aid. You know, I didn't. You know, I'm, I'm saying, I'm talking to you now, looking with 30 years of perspective now, but at that time he was still just an action aide. Nobody knew what the hell he was doing. Hmm. And, uh, you know, you talk to like Dee Dee or any of these other people, they didn't, they didn't know the extent of what Miscavige was up to. And uh, it, Gail took over after Dee Dee was uh, shit canned. And one of the things that Gail did was she just said, I don't have enough time to go made certain while she was on the, on the job that every time they went and saw Pat in Creston, that she would be there. Well, Gail said, yeah, you know, like, I don't want to be there anymore. I'm too busy with, you know, with WBC and all that. So, David, you just go there. And that was like Dave Miscavige unleashed. 
but I already found this out a lot later. Uh, but so, so how does Mary Sue respond to what you're telling her at the just, Bonaventure Hotel? After about three hours, she just capitulated and she said, all right, anything you want. She was tired and exhausted and you can imagine she was pretty freaked out about it. And uh, as you say, it was pretty brutal. Uh, and so two days later, I walk into the GO and just say, you're all out. Henning Helt, who was the deputy guard in the U.S., out. Jimmy Mulgan, who was deputy guard in something, intelligence or something, they're out. And uh, How are they out? Were they declared SPs or did they just like... No, I didn't, I didn't declare anybody. I didn't believe in declaring anybody. So were they just, you're out of the GO and you're a Scientology public? You have to join the Sea Org or your public, or if you want to stay in the Joe, you have to join a Sea Org. So it was, that was part of the deal was every, the Geo would be subsumed by uh, the Sea Org. And, and so that's really where the Sea Org wins the power struggle decisively with the fall of Mary Sue. Yeah, but I wouldn't say it was the Sea Org. I would say it was Miscavige because I didn't see it, and I, apparently nobody else did, what DM's whole scheme was. Yeah, and at the time, you wouldn't know. Do you know what laser prints are, Jeff? What, what, laser prints? Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure I understand well, the you, term. You, it's probably, it's pretty old. Back in, in 1980, laser prints were the new thing, or relatively new. And every independent, I mean, every Scientologist who wasn't in uh, on staff was selling laser prints. Oh, these are art objects. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and to pay for their grades and stuff like that. The Scavage told me one night, he said, you know, Bill, he kept on talking. I mean, like, this was late. And uh, he was... He was like real nervous and he said, look, I don't, I could never go out and work for a real job. And I certainly wouldn't want to do laser prints. I mean, that was the example he gave. He said, and I didn't really, I didn't know what the context he was talking about, but now I sort of see he was beginning to pad his own nest, feather his own nest in Scientology. This was going to become a career for him. And he parlayed it into such. That's a very intriguing insight. I don't know what else I would do for a living. I don't want to sell laser prints. And he, he's certainly, Miscavige is certainly canny enough to seize opportunity. Yeah, you know, you're talking about a guy who's got a ninth grade education. At that time, I guess he was 22, 23 years of age. You know, he was looking at like, hey, you know, what am I going to do for the rest of my life? And this is the best possible thing he could do. The best of all worlds for him would be to take over the Church of Scientology. Yeah. Because there's tremendous money. And, and would you agree that there were not a lot of people opposing him? Well, if, if you notice that he got rid of everybody who could have opposed him. You know, I had several attorneys when I uh, sort of started to come to my senses in early 82, uh, say to me, hey, look, you know, you're chairman of the board. And I said, but they voted me out. He said, but where, where are the minutes? Where's the meeting? You know, how, how did they do this? It sounds more like a coup d'etat. You want to fight this? Mm -hmm. And I just, at that point, I, I really began to realize that hey, this is just a money-making operation here. This is not uh, a gift to mankind, <laughs> which is what my belief had been. How did you lose the belief that it was no longer a gift to mankind? How do you, how do you lose that? Is it sudden or did it oh, happen it gradually? Oh, it crept up. First time it, I started really, it was unexpected. I was back in L.A., from Boston, and uh, that's when 
Hubbard came out with the quadruple grades. Do you remember that? Or the that four was, flows? That was way before you. No, but I mean, isn't that four flow? Yeah, that's right. Four yeah, oh, yeah, okay, yeah. I, I, I know it basically, yes. Well, at that point, I was a uh, class six, and I had ordered a, a fair amount of hours and, and I just said this is ridiculous you know and it was a company with so anyway get his his uh, marketing scheme Hubbard's marketing scheme was to get everybody back in who had gotten their excuse me their triple grades and give them the fourth grade you know and uh, and it was a company with a note saying you know you always have to give your your reg is something to sell. And hmm. I just, it, it, all of a sudden, it, it, somehow through all my, the shit surrounding me, I started, it sort of got through. I said, so this is just a marketing scheme. No, can't be right. But, you know, that was the beginning. That was the first chink. Now, did you ever feel that you were being set up as the fall guy when you became executive director international? Oh, uh, yeah. Absolutely. I uh, I remember I asked Laurel. It's, I I went up when Hubbard uh, that flag order appointing me as a CO or uh, COV and ED International. Uh, it was a for life appointment, and it was a flag order signed by him. So first thing I did was I went to WDC and actually sort of became a member of WDC. I, I worked with them for about two months at Gilman Hot Springs. Now, Bill, was, do you think that David Miscavige resented the fact that you were COB and EDN? I don't think at that point. I don't, so you weren't? I, I got a different take on things, but I don't think at that point he did. Because you weren't a threat to him? No. Uh, it, it, but it evolved into, he saw an opportunity. Uh, I think, I believe he saw an opportunity when in 1981, you know, he took a look at Hubbard. Hubbard was basically in hiding, but somewhere near San Luis Obispo and, uh, on that ranch of his. Yeah. Yeah. In Creston, California. Creston, that's right. And, uh. Hubbard really, his, he really got mentally impaired. He became that way. And it manifested itself mostly in this paranoia of his, which became extreme. And so it was very easy for, for uh, him to play on this paranoia. And he got rid of Dee Dee. Uh, Ries Didi Riesdorf. Gail Riesdorf. And he got rid of everybody. And then he got rid of Pat and Pat's wife. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm not surprised at that point. Hubbard just checked out, you know. Checked out as in dying. Yes. Bill, what I'd like to do is, is end this as part one and do a part two where we talk about some existential issues with Scientology and, you know, how you leave the church as an as a high level executive. And, you know, what happened feed, after feed first. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. I believe so. We'll, we'll leave it at that feed first. We've, I, Bill, I really appreciate having you on the show. I look forward to part two. For Surviving Scientology Radio, this is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Thank you for listening, and as always, we'll be in very good touch.